title of the talk tonight is Ego, Show Yourself. So uh, Sigmund Freud, um, almost, almost exactly 100 years ago, uh, developed this um, theory, psychoanalytical theory, um, one element of which was something that he called S, E-S, spelled E-S in German. And that was translated in, into English as ego. So a, new, a newly coined word um, to label um, this construct, um, a, a, a concept about how human minds tend to work. So once we've labeled it and named it, um, it seems like it has a greater degree of reality. And since then, people have, spiritual people anyway, have tried to figure out how to rid themselves of this ego. So one has to wonder what people before 1923 were trying to rid themselves of. It wasn't ego, it was whatever, something else. But the sense of, of trying to get rid of something that feels um, quite, quite intimate, like quite a part of our life, almost like our own nature, um, we end up being in this conflicted position where you know, we feel like we're, we should, for spiritual benefits, um, you know, try to be, be more selfless, be, um, you know, try to undo, try to um, separate ourselves from the sense of um, doing things, behaving in a way, saying things uh, that we hopefully, in um, our very human kind of way, hopefully, you know, enhance our sense of self, right? <laughs> and then now we're told, well, no, no that's not good. You, you know, it needs, the self needs to be diminished in some way. So we have sort of a, a conflict happening. We, we think that there's a spiritual benefit in, you know, trying to be more selfless and, um, you know, trying to distance ourselves from this ego that feels, you know, very much part of our life. Um, and, uh, and we're not so sure that's a good idea. You know, it sounds dangerous. You know, who would I be if I didn't have my familiar way of being to fall back on. So there's sort of a, a push and pull happening there where we think it's we think it's a good idea, but you know we're not so sure. We're not so sure what the outcome of that will be. Um, Adi Shanti, when he, he talked about ego, uh, sometimes called it the Migo, M-E-G-O. And um, you know, without trying to define it too precisely. It's just this sort of vague sense of personhood. Right? And sometimes the, the word is used in, in the sense of uh, sort of self-importance. You know, my ego got the best of me. <laughs> you know, or, it's, or it's used in a sense of um, how we identify ourselves or others. And then there's also a sense of it being sort of the subject of, you know, this organism, the, the actor inside, <laughs> um, you know, sort of playing its role. Okay, but however, however we define it, it seems like it really comes down to the ruling triumvir triumvirate, right? Me, myself, and I, that's what it basically comes down to. Um, just this sense of, I want what I want. You know, I may have, you know, developed more sophisticated ways of getting that, but, you know, at the root of it, that's, um, you know, that sense of self-enhancement, self, uh, you know, the you know, bringing happiness in this direction. Um, so the, in, in Buddhism, it talks about you know, three fundamental characteristics of life. Um, you know, the, the sense of impermanence, right? sense of suffering. In Sanskrit, the word dukkha, which doesn't mean like abject suffering necessarily. It's more like a, you know, sort of a discontent, you know, 
something feeling not quite right, it doesn't quite add up. Um, so it doesn't need to be, you know, just, you know, uh, on your knees suffering, but it can be a sense of anxiety or something not quite right. So we have impermanence and this sense of suffering. Most of us are okay with those, those two basic principles. It's uh, things that we can observe readily in life, that things are always changing. Everything that has form has a, has a lifespan, continuously goes through transitions. You know, we can see that. We may or may not like it, but we can don't have any trouble seeing it. Um, and the sense of uh, something being not quite right, not quite enough, uh, doesn't quite add up. You know, the sense of dukkha or suffering. Um, you know, we can, we're, we're good with that too. I mean, we may not like that characteristic, but we, there's no doubt in our mind that there's certainly that element in life. Um, you know, even apart from the... Uh, you know, the, the major um, aspects of uh, life's challenges like sickness, old age, and death, there are many sort of challenges that we come upon prior to that. So we, we have no trouble with impermanence, suffering, you know, we, we understand those as sort of basic fundamental principles of life. Which brings us to the third, sort of the third leg, which is no self. And this is where most people say, well, yeah, maybe, maybe the first two, I get those, but no self doesn't, um, we don't have any um, experience to sort of fit that principle into our life as we knew it growing up. It just wasn't part of the culture. It wasn't part of, um, and certainly in this country at least, part of um, our understanding of what we were. In fact, you know, in this country, almost the opposite was promoted, you know, rugged self-independence, you know, make your own way in the world. And uh, so this concept of no self is just quite contrary to that. Um, so, you know, if we, if we sort of ponder that, like, well, well I, wonder if, I wonder if that's actually true, you know? No self, really? Um, you know, and you can say, well, you know, the, it's what the, the Buddha pointed out, and, you know, we can sort of dismiss it or ignore it or sort of interpret it more in our favor. Um, one of the ways that we can sort of tone it down a bit and interpret it and say, well, I guess my ego is really that part of myself that I really don't care for, you know, where it's, it causes me problems when I act out of that sense of self in that way, you know, overly prideful or arrogant or confrontational or something. So maybe it's that part, that part that I need to get rid of and um, the part that's trying to get rid of that, you know, we say, well, that's my higher self, right? So we, we've sort of sliced our, our being. So we have two, two parts, one part that's, you know, the, um, you know, the uh, ne'er-do-well. And the other part that's holding the high ground, that's trying to keep keep our um, sort of more unruly side under control. <laughs> so, I mean, all that is, is we're, we're assigning, you know, names in our, to our thoughts. You know, these are the thoughts that I like over here. Those are the, the thoughts and actions and speech and behavior over there that I don't really care for. And uh, I'm gonna go to war. You know, I'm gonna try to win that battle and improve that side over there. And so we can spend a great deal of our time in, in our life um, on this self-improvement project, thinking that somehow that's, that's what getting rid of my ego is about. Just, just not a, my essential sense of self, but just the parts that you know, are clearly not very spiritual. But the problem is we're fighting both sides of that battle 
you know, believing somehow that, um, you know, our higher self will gain the upper hand. <laughs> but this uh, more unruly side of us, the more conditioned side, um, the side that we don't care for quite so much, has has a certain tenacity, right? It's it, you know, if if we try to sort of outsmart it, we find that it's more clever than we are. We, we find out that it's a, a formidable opponent. And we're not so, quite so sure that our willpower is up to the, up to the challenge. Right? You know, even sort of um, overcoming habits that we don't really like or exercising or changing our diet, just very superficial things, right? Still very challenging, right? You know, we have this, this will, we know what we should do, and then there's what we actually do. <laughs> and then we go into another spin where, you know, we feel bad about ourselves for being unwilling to overcome our unruly self and um, disappointed in our ability to follow through or gain the upper hand, etc. So, you know, we can go through those senses as well. Um, so we, we, when we hear about in, enlightenment, we think, well, you know, may, maybe if, if I do um, manage to get rid of this no self, maybe then I'll get enlightened. You know, I recognize this no self, get beyond these desires and tendencies and conditionings, then, then I'll get enlightened. So maybe maybe there's some payoff here. I'm, I'm willing to um, you know, go through some amount of exertion to try to examine this no self to see if it's actually true or not. But I mean, hopefully we can see that that, <laughs> that also is just another ambition of the self, right? seeking to improve its experience through this hoped for movement that we call enlightenment, you know. So if we can, you know, it, it may induce us to at least be willing to consider this no self, because what a, a lot of people do, a lot of it, spiritual people do is, you know, they're, you know, they get fairly far along in the practice, you know, working with impermanence, working with, you know, looking at suffering and how to undo suffering. Um, but this, this no self concept is just like a stumbling block um, because every, everything that we try to do to work with no self is only, um, the only instrument that we have to use it with is ourself, what we've always taken ourself to be. And so we're in this sort of odd position where what I take myself to be as this separate self is trying to undo itself, trying to work towards its own demise. And so there's, there can be this will in that direction, but there's also resistance in that direction because of our belief that it's actually true. It's actually real. You know, so, you know, we're sort of in this odd situation with ourself that we, it's, um, it's puzzling how to proceed with that. I mean, how do you even start if you recognize that the only instrument that you're working with is this personal self entity that we take ourselves to be? Um, and with the objective of undoing that, um, you know, it's almost like trying to lift ourselves up by our own belt. You know, it's um, hard to imagine how we would do that. So we can, again, go back to the Buddha saying, well, you know, he did say that there were these three principal things, two I get, one I don't. It seems difficult and I'm not even sure it's true, but he was the Buddha, so we'll give it the benefit of the doubt. And, um, you know, but maybe, you know, it's possible that the Buddha got two out of three right. You know, that was 
that, you know, in baseball, if you get two hits out of three times at bat, you'd be the best baseball player that ever lived. So, you know, maybe the Buddha got two right, but I'm not so sure about this no self. But if we, if we do decide to really investigate that, um, I'd suggest the place to start is to try to pinpoint where that sense originates from. And um, what we can do is rather than trying to go directly to find out among all the possibilities of where this sense of ego or me or self is actually housed, where it's actually located, um, it'd probably be easier to eliminate all the places that it's not located and then see what's left. You know, so then, then we're just looking at a much smaller environment. Okay, so let's just go through that, um, that process. So um, one of the things that we could do is start with our, our uh, senses, our five physical senses. So uh, let's just start with a sense of smell. So if we smell something, maybe, maybe food, cooking, um, you know, we, we can recognize that we as these bodies, these organisms have that capacity to smell the food, you know, for, for good or for bad, you know, whether the food is good to eat or, or not. Um, so that's, that's a useful sense, obviously. Um, but we don't ever believe that 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 our identity of who we are fundamentally is housed in the food. And the sense of smell of the food is a, a capacity that we have. Um, but if we lost our sense of smell, let's say we got COVID and lost our sense of smell and taste, um, we wouldn't doubt that we were still this you know, the same person that we were before, we just couldn't smell at that point. So it's also not the sense of smell or the object of smell where the, that sense of uh, self-identity is located. And we could say the same thing with hearing, useful function, obviously, um, sense it into our surrounding, gives us good information, but there's nothing in that sense where we would say, aha, that is where our identity is parked. It's a, it's a sense, it's a skill. It's useful, wonderful. Okay, so the sense of seeing is a little, is a little more complex. So if, if we look across the room and we see a chair, you know, we can say, okay, that, that's the chair. Um, you know, obviously my identity isn't, doesn't originate in that chair. And it doesn't even originate in my ability to see the chair. But if I shift my gaze a little bit and look down at my own body, in a sense, we're, you know, it's the same sense of sight. I'm, I'm looking at an object, in this case, the body. So from that perspective, it's not really all that different from looking at the chair, just two objects within the field of vision. But the, the sense of it is different, right? It's this, the sense is, you know, it's my body that I'm looking at, right? But where that sense of my body originates from is not in the sense of sight, it's not in the eyeballs, um, it's not in what's transmitted to the brain, it's what happens in the brain as an interpretation of that signal. And it's something that we learned um, later on in life. We didn't, we didn't have that filter the first year or so of life. We, as very young infants, we could obviously see our bodies, see our hands, um, move our hands, but we didn't know that they were my hands. That's, that's, the, that's what was missing. We only learned that a little bit later after a year or so. I mean, you can watch an infant when they first discover that, they are amazed by it. The fact that what they're looking at is somehow um, able to be sensed from within. So the sense of sight, even though the, the sense itself 
uh, could look at this body or the chair, um, they're different because of what we've learned during the course of the lifetime about what we're looking at. So there's that, um, that filter, that translation that happens in the mind. Um, so these, these senses uh, sort of, you know, reinforce from, you know, what we've learned to interpret, reinforce the sense of ourselves, but the identity is not actually parked in the sense themselves. So what we're, what we're left with now is not happening outside the body, as you could imagine. Um, so we're going to look inside the body. Um, but if we look at the body as a whole, um, you know, we've perhaps known people or seen people that have had uh, lost a limb, maybe in, in battle or accident, uh, lost a leg or um, arm. Um, but they, they wouldn't say that they're no longer who they were before. I mean, physically, they may have been diminished, but there's still that sense of self that um, you know, continues unabated. You know, they may have different opinions about themselves, but there's no doubt that that sense of self is continuous right before or after uh, such an accident. Um, my uh, sister had a, a lung transplant at Mayo Clinic, and um, there was some, <laughs> uh, she would tell the stories before she had the transplant. She said, well, some, some people who have transplant um, have, you know, a new uh, interest or new, you know, something that they may have never been interested in before after they had their transplant. So maybe... Uh, the person whose heart someone received had been fond of opera and suddenly this other person had never had any appreciation of opera before suddenly finds themselves interested in opera. Now whether you know that's just uh, anecdotal or that actually happens I don't know. I mean my sister said that um, she had some um, increased interest in motorcycles <laughs> after her lung transplant, you know, perhaps, or perhaps she knew where the organ came from. But the, the point uh, being that, um, you know, because this, because, you know, this organ is replaced or that, there's still that sense of self. My sister was still, my sister totally recognizable, you know, as, being who she has always been, um, you know, physically challenged, yes, but um, there's still that same essence about her. So um, even with a, a lung being replaced, um, there's still this the same sense of self. So, um, and to belabor the point, when we were at Mayo Clinic, Patty and I, we went to a, a organ transplant support group and um you know so we had a chance to talk to a, a number of people who had organ transplants one had a heart liver and both kidneys transplanted in the same operation and yet they there's they didn't maintain that they were a different you know a totally different person afterwards Okay, so we can see that whatever, um, you know, in our search for this location of ego or separate self or personhood, um, we, can, we can notice that it uh, not doesn't really reside below the neck. <laughs> you know, it's something else. And um, we can see that you know, what happens in the head within the brain, there's a lot of functions there that we're not even conscious of in terms of regulating the body and, you know, instructing the body what to do. Um, they're not even conscious of, so that's not, those functions aren't uh, where this self-identity is housed. So we're, we're, we're narrowing down where we're looking into um, those parts of, um, 
our thinking mind that um, we have some awareness of. Right? So those are you know, just broadly speaking, memory or uh, cognitive thinking, um, or just uh, this, this you know, sense of uh, being the doer, the thinker. Yeah. There's also, a, uh, I would also group emotions in there as well. So even though uh, we could say, well, emotions, you know, may not originate in the mind as such, but, you know, they, they're felt elsewhere in the body, perhaps. Um, but when we really look closely at it, we can see that many of those emotions, perhaps almost all of those emotions, are being fueled, especially the negative ones, are being fueled by thought. Thoughts about, you know, what I should do, what I shouldn't have done, what they could have, would have, should have done. Blame, judgment, all of that um, fuels uh, emotions in the body. And those emotions can generate more thoughts and then we have a cyclical storm happening. Um, we can also see that those thoughts and those emotions are always changing, always impermanent, always moving. So whatever it is that we essentially are, this sense of separate self, this ego, um, can't be anchored, can't be located in something that's always in a state of flux, always changing. So um, if we look at like our, our memory, you know, basically our storyline up to this point. Um, when we really look at it, we can see it's not so much the storyline itself, because the storyline isn't happening in this moment. But what is of, um, has a stickiness to it, is how, um, how we feel about the storyline, how we are relating to the storyline. That's, that's what, that's what um, creates this um, connection, this glue with ego. It's more our thoughts about our memories rather than the memories themselves. So we still come back to just thought. Um, and, you know, when we're looking for ego, so we've narrowed it down to just thought. It's, it's somewhere in the realm of thought. So when we're looking at this ego uh, for the precise location of it, we've eliminated, you know, external perceptions. We've eliminated, you know, our, our physicality of our body. We can eliminated, um, you know, the tenuous nature of emotions, memories, etc. And we, we come down to thought, as you might have expected. <laughs> so. Um, and when we, when we look at that thought happening, we can see that um, it arises. There's no question about that, uh, the fact that it arises at some point and then it recedes at some point. Where it comes from and where it goes to, um, we don't know. We could call it our unconscious. We could call it whatever. All we know for certain is that thought arises and then it recedes at some point, comes unbidden and leaves without a lot, a lot of fanfare. What we presume is that therefore there must be a mind that is thinking those thoughts. That's what we presume. So it's not the thought themselves that is the seat of this ego. It's a particular thought. You could you could almost say it's it's the linchpin thought, you know, the mother of all thoughts. The thought that I am the thinker of my thoughts. That thought. 
that thought that we we don't even believe it's true. We just assume, we don't even question that it's untrue. It's, we just take it for granted. That there is thought, therefore there must be a thinker of those thoughts. And we're quite certain about that because if we're challenged on it, we say, well, you know, where where is the thinker of that thought? And they just say, well, it's me, right? It's the certainty of the ego. I know it's me. That, that's that's who's thinking. But that doesn't solve anything. That just gives a different label to it. You know, we could call it our mind. We could call it me. We can call it ego. We could call it separate self. But still, it's it's just the same presumption that somewhere in there, there's this thinker of thoughts. But that, that presumption, that belief is just another thought. You know, when we go looking for the mind, the thinker, the thinking entity. We don't find it. You know? And we don't find it on the very first try. You know, if we look for it. Crickets. <laughs> Nothing. Not there. And we think, well, no, that can't be right. You know, I must have gotten it wrong. I'll ju I just have to try harder. I'll just you know, I, I know I can find it. it. It's in there, obviously, somewhere. Um, I just have to look harder. It's sort of like, um, you know, in these cops and robbers movies, you know, the, the, uh, the FBI agent comes to the door, pounds on the door, and says, I know you're in there. Come out with your hands up. <laughs> there's no answer but we do the same thing with you know the ego it's like ego you know i know you're in there somewhere just show yourself pull pull back the curtain and let me get a good look at it no answer right so when i was um I don't know, I must have been, I don't know, maybe eight or nine or so. And I um, had, had my own bedroom. And uh, when I would go to bed at night, I would go to bed, get under the covers, lie down. And um, the thought always occurred to me that there might be uh, a boogeyman under the, under the bed. And a boogeyman was sort of a I haven't heard that term in years, but you know, when I was young, it was popular, and it was um, just some sort of uh, vaguely defined, sort of nefarious entity, ghost-like, um, that you know had a bad attitude and could do you harm. I mean, that's that's what my friends told me, and I figured, well, you know, they might be right. So every every night when I went to bed, I I lay there for a while, and you know, it was about ready to go to sleep. And then I remembered, you know, the possibility of the boogeyman being under the bed. And so I got out of the bed, climbed down on the floor, looked underneath just to check. And then I got back up in the bed and I could go to sleep. But I would do that night after night. But each night it was like, you know, maybe tonight's different. You know, I, I had to be willing to look to be sure rather than not look and believe that everything was okay. So it's sort of like that in looking for the ego. We sort of, if we're just sort of generally presumed that it's, you know, it's there, but it's sort of, you know, sort of well behaved today. So I'm not going to, you know, worry about it too much. But without a willingness to really look closely at at the possibility um, of what that actually is, uh, it's always like. You know, something hiding under the bed where we're a little bit uneasy about it um, because we've never actually looked for it. So it's, it's, it really depends on our willingness to look um, 
hard. It's not, it's not a, it doesn't do any good to just believe that, well, you know, maybe the Buddha was right. Maybe there is no self. I'll, I'll go with that. that. That's not helpful. Actually, that's less than helpful. You know, what is really useful is um, to check it out for yourself as many times as necessary, to look as many times as necessary to try to pinpoint where this sense of separate personal self resides exactly. One of the benefits of meditation, I've talked about this before, of course, but one of the benefits of meditation is, you know, there's obviously physiologic benefits, but I would say maybe even more important is the uh, just taking that time uh, to spend some quiet time with our own mind and just watch it in action, see where it goes, see where it takes us, see what it's, you know, tries to convince us of, see what, what its tricks are, see what its blind spots are. Um, and just really get a good look at that mechanism because it's really that sort of objective observational uh, willingness to look closely that uh, has, has power to, to really unravel um, this sense of self. So rather than just trying to get rid of it, which doesn't help because that just is a confrontational thing. You know, you're just pitting your, you know, your willpower against some concept and um, it won't work, right? You have to just really see that it, and not only doesn't work, it actually empowers it because it gives it a reality that it doesn't have. Our fear of it, our reluctance to look at it empowers it, right? But if we take that, that same energy and rather than confronting this, you know, theoretical construct that Freud came up with, rather than confronting that head on, we can just look and see, well, you know, before I try to get rid of it, let's, let's see if it's really true. It really exists in the first place. And we can see all the debris that it leaves behind, all the thoughts and actions and things that we later feel bad about saying, all of that we can see, but what we never actually see is that ego. That we, that we don't see, we never see. That sense of separate personal self. But the way to really see that it's illusory nature is to, is to really look carefully at it to see what's actually there again and again. You know, and when it is seen clearly, that illusion drops. It's not like we have to get rid of the ego. Our job is to see that it's just not true. It's not something that we actually you know, forcibly surrender. We can't do that because the only thing that wants to do that is, um, you know, some belief in self-improvement. So what, what, we, what we can do though, is to look closely at how that movement happens, how that, how that thought structure convinces us that there's something real there, the sense of self that isn't actually there at all. So it's not, it's not like we get rid of it. <laughs> what we do is find out that it never actually existed. We never actually were separate from the one reality. We couldn't be, we couldn't be in the past, we couldn't be now, and we can't ever be any other time either. So when we wake up from that 
imagined dream of a separate self, then we recognize that we never, never were separate. You know, there's a there's a sense of just coming home, coming home to our um, coming home to our original nature, our that place um, in all of us that has the potential just to feel uh, completely at home in this skin, in this life, in this world. That's the potential. The potential for seeing through um, what is just a mis misinterpretation, a simple thought that is not even questioned, just that thought that I am the thinker, that's who I am. Therefore, what I think is true, what I believe is true. When we can see that thoughts happen, no doubt, there's just not a thinker of those thoughts. This ego that we're so desperate to get rid of, um, it's just a, another thought, another composite thought that we take ourselves to be, that's it. That's what, you know, all this, worry and concern about surrendering the ego that that's what's surrendered a misinterpretation that's as bad as it gets so we give up what we never were to find out what we always were that's the trade we give up the separate self to find out that what we actually are is everything Thank you.